You like violence? British science fiction's got some brutal violence. It has violence as mindless fun. Violence is an art. Violence is a tool with which to smash the state. British science fiction creators have been appalled by our yacht mentality, but they've also glorified in it. So come on, all you space hooligans, and have a go if you think you're hard enough. Coming up, the beautiful violence captured on the lurid pages of British science fiction comics, from the ruthless justice of Judge Dredd's 2000 AD to the grenade-throwing anarchists of Alan Moore's V for Vendetta. But first, oh my brothers, I have a confession. Inside, I still hanker after revolt, riot, and the sudden sharp snap of mindless violence. You see, there's this book, and in this book, young men get to do what comes naturally to them. Fighting, stealing, raping. The British science fiction idea of ultraviolence was invented in the Clockwork Orange. Now, ultraviolence means violence is a hobby or violence is an art. And the hero of Clockwork Orange is Alex Delarge. Alex is a vicious young thug. He's smart, attractive, but completely amoral. And like so many young men pissed off at society, Alex gets his kicks by kicking your head in. He's Alex the Large, as enlarging it, as in taking up more space. Alex the Large, larger than life, cock of the concrete walkway, dandy with a knuckle duster. He's made more of himself than the insipid proles humping away in their tower blocks. Burgess invents this idea of ultraviolence in Clockwork Orange, which could only have come out of Britain, I think. It's about an almost aesthetic pleasure in extreme acts of random and arbitrary violence for their own sake. So ultraviolence is not only violent, it's pointless and revels in its pointlessness and is so nasty that it almost becomes art. In the book, Alex is about 15. He likes going out with his mates, Dim, Pete and Georgie. They hang out on the estate, they get wasted, they maybe do a bit of joyriding. They're your classic working class teenage tearaways, but they're known in Clockwork Orange as droogs. Alex and his pretty droogs graduate from mindless violence against individuals to rooks with and against the state. The droogs are as British as the Queen of England's tits. Alex Delarge was there at every beating ever administered by a teddy boy, a punk or a Chelsea headhunter. Look into the eye of a football hooligan or a poll tax rioter and you will see the glint of Alex Delarge. My introduction to British science fiction and ultraviolence came through comics. Now, the writers of these comics were, pretty much to a man, working class punks. Now, I've got to remember, this is a time when Margaret Thatcher ruled over the nation like some kind of android queen. The working class were pretty angry, and that rage found itself onto the pages of comics for kids, like 2000 AD. Two Thousand AD comes out every week. It's a collection of violent and witty science fiction comic strips. The first issue hit the streets in 1978, and it's been going at it hard ever since. And the kids love it. Two Thousand AD was great because it had a lot of humour in it, and a lot of invention, and it did what British science fiction does best, which was imaginative, slightly ironic taking the piss, but at the same time actually exploring some interesting areas. The best thing about 2000 AD is that it's always been subversive. It's got these, uh, these radical, anarchic, left-wing, working-class, angry young men writing stories for kids, rewiring their brains, changing the way they think. <laughs> 2000 AD spat out working class rage, a gob in the face of the establishment, and it was hawked up by one angry young punk, founding editor Pat Mills. 
nearly all the heroes in 2000 AD and battle and action um, very rarely come from the officer class. They're, they're nearly always sergeants and invariably it's the officer class who are villains, which is clearly reflecting a personal chip on my shoulder. 2000 AD appalled the officer class of its own publishing company, those chinless mooks of middle management. There was a lot of negativity towards us within the management of the, of the company I, I worked for. They really didn't want us to succeed uh, because we represented a threat to the status quo. 2000 AD was never going to be safe and sappy like Star Trek. Pat Mills wanted to create a harder science fiction that kicked against the pricks. Yeah, everybody said, well, what do you want? What do you want? Look, this is science fiction. You know, you have phases to stun and this kind of stuff. I said, no, I don't want that. I want something harder. I want more balls to the thing. Not surprisingly, the comic attracted disapproval from the sows of the moral majority. And I'd be writing these stories or editing them on the train and... Uh, uh, I remember one day Mary Whitehouse was sitting opposite me. She lived in the same area and I, of course she didn't know who I was, but I recognised her. And I remember writing in some particularly gory <laughs> scene on the basis of, this one's for you, Mary. <laughs> the most controversial early story of 2000 AD was Invasion. It was about Britain being taken over by the Russians, or the Volgs as they were called. Pat saw the chance to crack some establishment skulls. Look, he said, if you do the opening episode, you can have Angela Rippon announcing this on the, on the news. You can have uh, Margaret, Margaret Thatcher shot on the steps of St Paul's Cathedral by a Russian commissar. I said, stop there, John. I'm your man. I had to do it. I had to do it. The hero of Invasion was the gritty working class truck driver, Bill Savage. I have fond memories of Bill. He had that same sheepskin coat-wearing, sawn-off shotgun-waving panache of John Thor in the Sweeney. The hero Bill Savage, who's an East End truck driver with a sawn-off shotgun, going around blowing away Volgs left, right and centre. And it's basically deeply racist, but at the same time unredeemed, un-PC, violent British working-class fun. And we made the front page of The Guardian, and uh, this was followed up by all kinds of worthies saying how... Um, comics shouldn't be doing this and there'd been attempts to do this before. They all took themselves far too seriously. We just wanted to have fun. 2000 AD was meant for kids, which is astonishing if you think of the amount of violence in it. I loved it so much I used to trek from newsagent to newsagent in Liverpool in search of a copy. When I found one I'd take it home and pour over it. I used to love the way that when people were punched the artists would draw the teeth flying out of their mouths. I used to love the way it was written in a futuristic lingo that your parents couldn't understand. And I used to love the way that if you read 2000 AD you were part of a gang. There's a great cover with a guy running into the sea being chased by giant scorpions and he's like please let me drown before the giant scorpions get me and to a little kid this was absolutely terrifying you know people being eaten by dinosaurs and blown apart and decapitated and thrown into the jaws of giant flesh dozers it's just great stuff you know and where where else could you get that when you're an eight-year-old kid in 1977. I was one of those eight-year-old kids and it never did me any harm. There is an unashamed fun to be had in watching extreme violence and destruction unfold on the page, rendered in all its gory detail. It's a laugh. One of the latest stories is about Bad Mother, a psychopathic version of Big Brother with famous contestants who are thinly disguised versions of today's B-list celebrities. Chris Evans gets disemboweled and uh, Melinda Messenger eaten by worms and Jamie Oliver is fed to wild mutant dogs. So that's obviously highly entertaining and thoroughly deserved. A big part of 2000 AD is big guns, big barreled guns with big bullets and big exit wounds. It's big gun fun. One of the things I used to get a real kick out of when I was a little kid reading 2000 AD was all the cool hardware. One of the main 
things to enjoy about the stories was they had these incredibly cool guns and they do these little cutaway drawings of how they all work. And I just like, I just love one of those, take it to school. And there's a friend used to have a picture of Durham Red, the vampire character from Strontium Dog, was it? Um, and she's sort of sitting there with her huge tits and this enormous gun across her lap. But there's more to 2000 AD than big guns nestling in big tits. Its real subversion is its sneaky satire, as in the anti-human adventures of Nemesis the Warlock. With Nemesis the Warlock, you have a story where the humans are the villains and the aliens are the heroes. And so you have these alien planets and the humans arrive and they're the monsters, you know, they're the bugs from Starship Troopers. They're, and, and these poor aliens are running in terror. Now, if you, if you think of our, uh, our colonial past, that doesn't seem unreasonable. The story is all about racism. Nemesis is an alien freedom fighter, and man is his enemy. The humans are the Ku Klux Klan, ethnically cleansing the universe of the impurity of the aliens. Cleanse and purify Cleanse my and purify. brothers is their sort of phrase as they sort of swipe off the heads of cute aliens and their small babies, and um, just generally spreading their kind of like white supremacist mayhem throughout the galaxy. Which is and what bratty Droog doesn't love 2000 AD with its horror show stories for twisted kiddiewinks. So the British citizen is polite, is he? Known for his manners, is he? In the end, your Beethoven and your books are just so much bourgeois bollocks. We will take to the streets. We will riot. We will be ultra-violent. Next up, the police get in a few digs of their own with the absurdly hard lawman of the future, Judge Dredd. Welcome back, oh my brothers, to further ultraviolence, served up for your delectation. Mindless violence will only get you so far in life. In fact, it will play right into the hands of authority. If you misbehave, it gives the referees and the judges and the police a good excuse to slap you down, hard. And in SFUK, the authority figure who delivers the hardest slap is the most famous character in British comics. There's a lot of violence in 2000 AD, and the man who inflicts most of it is Judge Dredd. Now, Dredd is a policeman of the future, ruthlessly enforcing the law in an insane megacity. Around the time I was reading Judge Dredd, my own father was a policeman in another insane city, Liverpool. Mind you, my dad didn't have Dredd's lawgiver that fired high explosive bullets, though I think he would have liked one. Judge Dredd is the most popular character in 2000 AD. He is a policeman in Mega City One and he practices zero tolerance. Dredd is judge, jury and executioner. Despite the fact he's a complete right-wing violent fascist, um, when the shit comes down, he's the guy you want on your side because flower power doesn't do you any good when, you know, they're breaking down the door, you know. In Mega City One, the shit comes down as often as the rain in Manchester. The city takes up half the eastern seaboard of the US. That's 400 million people. And it's up to Judge Dredd to keep order. He handles over 100 serious crimes a day. There's no time for the courts to get involved. Justice is served from the barrel of his gun. Like, a Dredd's got this lawgiver gun that fires six different types of bullet, you know, and you've got high explosive and ricochet and incendiary and armour piercing. You know, when you're eight, you love that kind of thing. There's a certain type of reader that likes this macho shithead that's blowing people's heads off, and they, like, they, they identify with Judge Dredd rather than with the people that are having their heads blown off. That's half the pleasure of Dredd, the fact that there's a body count. He, he is a complete bastard. He will shoot you in the back of the kneecaps if you try and run away from him. He's not, he's not the, uh, the clean... Uh, square-jawed Dan Dare type heroes of old British comics. He's a complete fucker and he'll blow your brains out if you look at him funny. 
I was worried that my appreciation of Judge Dredd was somewhat unsophisticated. So I attended a meeting of the Montgolfier Society, who clued me in on the sociological background, one might say, the cultural soil that fertilized 2000 AD. These, these comics, Action First and then 2000, grew in the same cultural soil as punk. There's no doubt about that. You know, you've got the, the 60s hippie dream is over. Um, in the 70s, you've got all the skinhead and football hooliganism and so on. And we are looking at England here. Um, all that stuff's on the streets. Violence is in the cinema. It's in the newspapers. It's happening on the streets all around. Reality is shitty and it's getting Reality worse. Reality is pretty shitty and it's getting worse. <laughs> Punks crop up everywhere in Judge Dredd, generally appearing at the other end of Dredd's fist. Yet the more Dredd inflicted violence on the punks of Mega City One, the more that the punks at home reading the comics loved him. He is the law. So it seems kind of strange and ironic that in a way he became a big punk icon. Uh, but of course he did. Um, a lot of this, is, I think, is because that in many ways Dredd isn't really a hero. He's, uh, he's not even an anti-hero. A lot of the time, he's actually the villain of the story. <laughs> they, they do enjoy uh, putting those images in there. Like, you know, the one that I always remember is the gaze into the fist of dread, you know. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's yeah, and, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm a nice, soft, liberal girly, but I think that's such a fantastic image. He goes, gaze, gaze into, into the, the face, face of, of death. death. And he opens his visor, which yeah. is supposed to paralyse you with and terror. Dread goes, goes gaze into the face of dread. <laughs> smashes this skull. <laughs> Judge Dredd was undoubtedly a fascist, but most of the writers who worked on his stories were very left-wing, so it was difficult to tell whether we were meant to be on Dredd's side or not. Of course we're meant to love Dredd. Any good droog knows that if you want to get away with murder, wear the uniform. One writer is well clued up on what happens to a man when he puts on a uniform, when he decides to become a superhero. Get ready for the twisted psyches beneath the polished helmets, courtesy of Alan Moore. Alan Moore's most famous comic is The Watchman. It puts superheroes into the real world. We'd originally just intended to do um, a radically different take on the superhero. You know, let's kind of think what the world might actually be like if there were really superheroes. And that took us into some quite strange territory. I think what Alan Moore did with Watchmen that was brought a uniquely British sensibility to a very American genre of superheroes is that he he brought this very questioning uh, eye to it, to the world of superheroes. He not only said, well, what would, what would a society be like if it allowed these kind of characters to exist? Uh, and what would the moral implications or the political implications of a character like a Superman figure, what would they be? This big blue nuclear Superman called Dr. Manhattan wins the Vietnam War in two months. As a result, Nixon stays in power. The superheroes become the pawns of the American right wing. Watchmen is a sardonic, witty, British take on an American myth. And the character of the Dan Dryberg, the, the night owl character, we see, you know, he's sexually impotent, he can't get it up until he dresses up as a night owl and goes out and rescues people from a burning building. And then suddenly, bing, he's back in action, you know. The most squalid of the superheroes is Rorschach, an ugly runt, eats baked beans straight out of the can and is a vigilante. His superpower is that he is basically insane. Alan Moore shows us the reality of what it's really like to be a masked vigilante. I think that the most popular character in comics was the uh, Wolverine character from the X-Men, who was um, a self-confessed violent psychopath. And I thought, oh, so, you know, the readers really like violent psychopathic vigilantes. You know, these sort of driven, revenge-obsessed Batman figures, these creatures of the night. And I thought, well, it would be kind of funny to actually show what it would be really like, psychologically, to be that sort of person. You'd be the next best thing to a, a serial killer. Nothing would interest you apart from your mission, 
you'd be living in complete squalor, you wouldn't have any friends, you'd probably have a personal hygiene problem, you'd have a horrible personality that would alienate everybody, you'd be just obsessed with revenge and violence and punishing criminals. But an even more antisocial invention of Alan Moore's is V, the hero of V for Vendetta. V is a Guy Fawkes style anarchist who blows up Parliament. He is a rebel against a fascist British state, inspired, not surprisingly, by Margaret Thatcher's government. So when I started writing V for Vendetta, you were starting to get um, that big summer of riots. And it was out of those tensions that I started to sort of come up with this Orwellian fantasy of, of V for Vendetta. Alan Moore imagines the day-to-day -day life of a Nazi Britain. There are surveillance cameras on every street corner, and even TV is filled with racist primetime propaganda. At what would British television, good old reliable British television, be like under a Nazi government? And I figured that it would probably be pretty much like ordinary British television, but more Nazi. You know, Benny Hill with a swastika armband. V is messed up. He was experimented on in the concentration camps of Britain. Just as V is not a straightforward hero, so his enemy, the state, is not just jackboots and gas chambers. They are the British people after all. They may be Nazis, but they're also your neighbours. So I started to take the Nazis, um, the government figures, that uh, were in the book and make them not sympathetic necessarily but credible that they weren't necessarily bad people that they had different reasons for going along with the regime sometimes fascists can obviously be quite persuasive v for vendetta ends in revolution so alan moore was being optimistic but back in the real world politics took a different turn I mean, I was starting to realise that actually I'd been incredibly naive, that I'd assumed that in order to impose some form of fascism upon the British people, you'd have to have a minor nuclear war and a brutal fascist uprising. Whereas, in fact, what, you, what Margaret Thatcher proved was that all you really have to do is to offer them the chance to buy their own council house. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. Science fiction in Britain has stoked up revolution. And when we were all living under the skirt of the Iron Lady, admit it, how many of you wish to rise up and do her an injury? Next week on SF UK, British heroics in the face of the alien hordes, from Dander to Blake 7 to C3PO. <laughs> <laughs>